Hello, hello. My name is Nora Medlin, and this session is on maximizing project success and high value partnerships. My background, I acquired a bachelor's in networking technology way back in 2006. I almost immediately, after getting my networking technology degree, went into software development uh, and spent quite a bit of time in software development. A few years later, I did actually attend a master's in innovation and entrepreneurship program at Full Sail University out of Florida as well. Um, I might not have mentioned previously, but my bachelor's was at a creative college also in uh, Tempe, Arizona. And why did, I create, why did I choose creative colleges? Well, I really wanted to be surrounded by creatives. I never considered myself to be a creative myself, uh, though I might do some sketching on the side. I will say that my eye has always been on management of some kind. Um, you know, I really uh, stuck around that software development world for quite some time just because it was really great to make something out of nothing. You know, just that concept. Uh, so over two decades in the software development industry, I call myself language and platform agnostic at this point. I started out uh, doing uh, uh, proprietary student information systems for Universal Technical Institute using a programming language nobody knows called Progress 4GL and uh, progressed into uh, using Drupal and web development honestly very soon after because I felt like there was more expansion in that area. I would say that I'm also an analytics geek and I now today help organizations improve market share via strategic initiatives and process improvement. I'm very business process focused. But as a servant leader, you know, I, I like to say that I achieve uh, continuous learning through mentorship and facilitation also. So you might have seen me around. I'm the intern coordinator for Drupal for Gov. And we'll get into a few other things that I also involved myself in here over the past couple of years. So let's get into the meat of the talk. Getting started. When you are uh, you know, getting started with your project, uh, you've you got to start somewhere. And usually where that somewhere is, and this you know, may be a, a, a basic understanding here of getting started, but you are going to have your uh, new business sales handoff after that contract is signed. There needs to be some sort of sales handoff. And it should be initiated by that sales team or the project management director. Uh, agenda items would be something to the effect of terms and scope, very high level. And we're just talking about a conversation between the sales team and the project manager coordinator. Maybe a development lead if you can get them in the room really early, that would be great. Uh, but honestly, right after that, we really need to get into a call with the client where uh, you know, we're making sure that there is a good PM fit with that sales client. We might think so, but not until you get in that room with that client do you really know how well uh, they're going to work together. Overview of the project timeline and our next steps are discussed in general uh, during that sales handoff. All right. And during, uh, you know, after you do that sales handoff, you know, I think it's really important that we get started uh, you know, with on the right foot, with good communication. So we want to have an email uh, to schedule the kickoff workshop. This is going to be more uh, broad audience on both sides that are going to talk about aligning on goals with their communication plan and timeline. As an example um, that we have up here, uh, we're providing for a client where a relationship is already established. You would want to include a link I think that this is really something that gets missed a lot. I, I leverage Calendly or Microsoft Team Bookings or something like that, but just get something in there right at the end. Schedule this with your team. Let's make this happen. Let's move forward. It's optional as well to include an inclusion accessibility statement. I think that I found in some environments it can be nice to have something in there that says, you know, let us know if your team needs periodic breaks or if uh, there's any particular um, accessibility issues that we might need to address. Just give them the option. 
And a similar email may be sent to a, a new stakeholder or to a, a transitioning, uh, a, a person that's transitioning, uh, or I'm sorry, a, if you're transitioning to a new PM is what I mean to say. So meaning that, you know, e even if uh, you're in the middle of a project, you know, something like this might be valuable uh, if your team changes dramatically. I like to talk um, and ask questions here at th throughout my uh, presentation. So my question to you is, what do your initial communications look like? Internally, externally, when you're kicking off a project? Do you just send an email? Do you get on a Slack? Um, anyone in particular want to say what their internal communications look like? Please? Usually email. Email? Usually email, so something very similar to this. And if maybe you have an existing partner, but go ahead. Email as well? Okay, so traditionally it's email, I, I do hear that as well. So here we go, we're going to kick off. Uh, early alignment and setting the tone, that's what we're doing here. Uh, the business and client team uh, building inclusion and transparency is the focus. Uh, many agencies are uh, great at getting contracts and sign, contracts signed and later implemented. However, in between, there are often many delays as the team is getting built, which can cause overruns and affect meeting initial and final milestones. It's important to have a good idea of how to get resources lined up and kicked off as soon as possible. Um, so, you know, produ producers and production managers, therefore, should build and be involved with building and updating processes and templates around these initial and critical stages. What I mean by that is that I think it has a lot, this happens a lot, where you know, we get signed and we have an idea maybe about what our first stages are, but there is often a delay in you know, getting that team together. Maybe we didn't know everything and now we have to wait two to three weeks before we're actually gonna get started. And I think if you, you know, do your due diligence and really just have those templates available, have it ready to go, just get it out the door, get the meeting scheduled, and get that kickoff scheduled specifically. So for your client kickoff, uh, you know, uh, I think, again, just to reiterate that the agenda items here are to align on goals, communication, plan, and timeline, um, that the team member should also do introductions, an icebreaker activity. Um, some of the icebreaker activities that I've seen out there are pretty standard, you know, like what is um, your favorite color or, you know, kind of not really digging in and, and talking about who they are. I kind of like talking more to, like, what is your favorite movie or where did you go vacation this last summer or something like that. So, you know, dig in a little bit, get people to really break down those walls immediately and, and talk with each other. Uh, but primarily we're looking to get, you know, see what everybody's looking to get out of the project. And this is all from both sides, you know, this is not just from the stakeholder side and being clear and aligning on those goals, but also uh, there may be some individual goals that a particular team member on, uh, on the agency side is looking uh, to get out of that project. Some potential challenges you might have here is internal politics. So you do probably want to think first about you know, who you're inviting into the room. If there are multiple stakeholders, uh, they may have opposing goals. Uh, so you know, just keep organized with this particular event um, and you know, uh, focus on what that project is and what those particular goals are around that particular project. But really, you know, the whole point here is that it's to provide team members with the opportunity to develop new and possibly long-term beneficial cross-departmental relationships. I've actually seen um, some great success out of uh, the kickoffs initially when you do have those stakeholders that have never met before, potentially, and they get to know each other where they might not have worked with each other previously before, you know? Uh, you may also include a discussion around meeting cadence um, if it's not already covered previously, but again, if you have a very large client kickoff, and you know, it may not be absolutely necessary to go into the nitty gritty details of what those day to day meeting cadences are and just reach out with your uh, product owner um, specifically, on, or business owner specifically. Now your internal kickoff you know, I think in some ways this is probably the more important meeting, and it 
might be missed. You know, I've, I've definitely seen where a client kickoff happens, where the entire team gets together, but there isn't a separate initial in, or internal kickoff as well. This is really where you're going to dig in and make sure that all of the team members on your internal side are familiar with each other. They, again, might have been on other projects before and never met. They, you know, need to get to know each other, potentially. Uh, but also, more importantly, there might be some skill sets that you're looking to uh, clarify what their particular roles are in that particular project. And so you want to go over those things, including your standard timeline and scope, um, your uh, aligning on those roles, like I was saying, uh, defining your next steps and any resourcing needs that might be there. One thing that I, I really am strong about on the internal kickoff to include though, honestly, is the onboarding piece. This is simple stuff like links to your project resources. What is the URL of the site? What is the Git uh, repo URL of the site? You know, what, what is that uh, getting my local development environment uh, process look like? These are real simple things, but often they are big, big questions that come up at the very beginning of a project. Depending on your size and the complexity of the team, uh, there might be a separate rah-rah meeting. So with party hats that I got up here, <laughs> you might have, uh, you know, if you have large, complex, like multi-matrix teams, you might have those separate, smaller rah-rah meetings that will help get those team members to uh, really meld together well. But after your kickoff, again, it's kind of easy to lose steam. Okay, we know, team, what we're doing, what we're going to be doing. This is the alignment, you know, we were aligned on the goals of the project and, and we're going to make this happen. You might have even done some planning on sprints and things like that, but let's keep it going. So one of the tools that you might use, and I have a, a QR code here for a Miro template, on the project management side is to go through this process of understanding you know, how often and um, how much detail do your st stakeholders need to be involved in communications about the project. So the purpose here again um, is that too many notifications can be very noisy and distracting to team members. You know, we're talking internal and external, honestly. But on the external side, you might have a director that really only needs to see those top level high bullet points um, at certain, certain intervals, right? Whereas your uh, uh, business owner is going to need to know on a more frequent basis and a more detailed level basis. So this is just an exercise to get an idea of like where they kind of fall on that map. Um, and I think that, uh, and just to explain it here, we have influence um, on the y-axis and interest availability on the X axis, um, and <clears throat> you uh, honestly don't have to use a form formal graphic like this. It's just something to keep in mind. I think you could kind of translate it to a simple list, uh, but it's really valuable, especially when you have shared resources on the project management side. Let's say I need to take a vacation for a week or go to an event, I need someone else to take over. Uh, that information will be useful to whoever is taking over for me during that week. But as long as the team has a good understanding of how each stakeholder needs to be communicated with, you'll be on the right track. Um, and again, I like to maintain something like a confluence page where I list out those stakeholders and blurbs about what things they are involved in specifically, especially if you have larger or num numerous stakeholders and their product owners. Uh, they might be uh, specific to a particular area, so make sure to note that information. Um, one kind of story around this is I've actually had a, a few situations where a point of contact is what I would call an extreme uh, subject matter expert, you know, somebody that triages support tickets from end users and asks for frequent updates in Slack, um, but they're uh, not the actual decision maker on the project, um, and that not really very technical at all. Um, so it's good to have a, an idea of like how much should you actually uh, communicate with that particular individual in order to um, have a more measured uh, engagement with that person and, and not be susceptible as much to noise.
Here's an email uh, that I like to send after the kickoff. It's really all about you know, making sure that you're recapping what you have done and what your next steps are. You know, I think that the focus on next is really important um, when getting started with your project um, and or throughout the project. It, is if you focus on that next, you do your retros and everything else during, throughout the process, but um, if you focus on that next, you will be able to move forward relatively well. Keep them thinking about what value has been provided and what's coming up, basically. And include you know, a summary of your meeting cadence or any other decisions that are already made in this Next Steps email. Uh, set expectations around a high-level timeline, at least, or keep that updated with each of your updates. But this, again, sets the tone that you are going to, how you're going to engage with your point of contact moving forward. Now, this is actually the part of the um, presentation here, and I'm glad that we had a few join us, um, that I would say is the meat of my uh, presentation here today, <clears throat> is this concept to do with discovery first. You really don't know what you don't know until you get into things. You know, I think that we've all had a situation where you scope a project, and then you start digging into it, and there's a lot of things that you discover that you didn't have any idea about before. Maybe there's some stakeholders that had some ideas that didn't get documented in those requirements um, in the uh, project scope. And you can easily suffer from cart before the horse syndrome and end up inadvertently subjecting clients to a, a smoke and mirrors type phase of the project where they uh, meeting frequency is high but you have little output that's actually happening. But so to avoid this pitfall, you have to set clear criteria towards project goals and help to help bridge this gap uh, between research strategy and implementation. So what I'm talking about here, and let me give you an example. <clears throat> in a world without, uh, in a fixed bid sort of world, which I think most of us live in, in Gov, right? Uh, there may be a loosely defined scope, and that's really the combination that you that you want to try to avoid. But uh, in a fixed bit, loosely divine scope, you uh, will generate pre and present sales proposal and get signed. And then you'll start your design and POC. As you align, you likely need to go back and ask for more stuff, more time, more money. That might be a change order that you have to do. And then, you know, you might be able to start building at that point, right? You might actually be able to do some work and produce some content or produce some value. But honestly, this still happens. You might have another change order that comes up, and even in the build process, and you have to figure that out and see if you can get more funding again that way. This can get really messy really quickly. You know, I've only drawn a couple scenarios here, but I think we've all experienced a situation like this. So let me ask this question. I mean, wh what, what are some challenges with this process? Does anyone have any particular suggestions as to why this might be an issue? Especially in the gov world, we might see that we have fixed bid, right? That we're needing to stay within that budget, maybe. Uh, but you aren't getting paid if discovery is uh, part of the sales process potentially as well. So sometimes you'll have this discovery end of things and uh, you'll uh, you know, try to get a, a better understanding of what's going on um, before you actually sign the contract, but you're spending dollars, you know, labor dollars on that. Again, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and you're easily caught up in an endless change of order extension loop here that I'm talking about. So as an example, I have a few. I'll just uh, go ahead and highlight one of them here. A higher ed site redesigned from D7 to D9. Client wanted to decouple Drupal backend using Layout Builder with Gatsby front end and, and for a developer on their side to own all the Gatsby front end work. Uh, but... <laughs> It was funny because, you know, this kind of happened and we started going cherry on top. Uh, content migration was included in the, was, was not included in the scope. 
And that really threw a wrench. You know, we had to go back to kind of the drawing board with that particular example. Okay, so let's get into, um, well, let me ask the question again. Has, has anybody experienced this before? You know, any particular story that you might want to share about a fixed bid that had a change in scope, disaster, or maybe sequence of change in scopes throughout the process of the project? Yes? I'm sure that most of us have, right? <laughs> So what, what I'd like to propose, and I think that this is something that most of us do, but we don't do at the same time, is a discovery first approach. The idea here is that you, even with a fixed bid, and I know that this is a, a, can be a contracting question, um, even with a fixed bid, break it up, break it into phases. So this is how it looks. This empowers your decision makers with, the, with this approach. The purpose here in the discovery first approach is uh, you will get your requirements and envisioning together. It's a separate engagement. It definitely can be a selling point for some agencies that have the flexibility to uh, scope their projects smaller as well. But the client can take value, take this value and go somewhere else to build potentially as well. So that's how you can maybe sell it as well. Is the idea is to just go through the discovery here first. If you like it, if you don't like it, that's fine. Uh, we've at least given you some good recommendations. And it's all about getting all the nuts and bolts in order in order to outline objectives for development and help identify a roadmap to implementation. So, you know, you get your requirements, you start building, maybe that's just a POC that you're building there, or a design, or a high-level design. But having your objectives um, you know, outlined here, um, and, and really, at the end, you're uh, figuring out what that, this deploy sort of outcome here is that you have those objectives that you can use to inform uh, your next phase. Honestly, I've seen that if you do break it up, your earnings can be larger in this way because you will know more at the end of that initial phase, discovery phase, in order to inform what that budget will look like moving forward. There's also, uh, you know, forcing to have, uh, you know, sort of larger milestones and checkpoints um, that, are, that are happening here as well to, to increase velocity and interest among the in internal team members and reduce fatigue. Um, but really, it's just bringing you know, people in alignment closer to what those expectations are and not having something huge that we're having to deal with. So, on a phased approach, uh, again, what we're talking about here is to break it up. And this is typical of a lot of Agile projects. You'll see with a lot of frameworks, including Scaled Agile, which I think does it really well, uh, that you have planning intervals over 10 weeks and that you're coming back um, you know, together as an entire organization to move forward with the next phase, that sort of thing. Um, in an agency contract world, you know, I think that this still works well as well. Easier to swallow, smaller chunks. That's the idea here. So, just to give you a diagram here of this phased approach, <clears throat> you might have something like this. You have several different phases there at the bottom. Uh, you're going to get a higher return on investment as you go through each of these things. Uh, the purpose here in uh, the beginning and visioning phase, you often would have something uh, deliverables like a POC or a prototype, a technical approach document, uh, maybe a little bit of design. You know, you might not have a design. You could choose. You know, how many of these things are you delivering within that first phase? But really, uh, you know, just focusing on this first part, you know, this first discovery part, uh, will give you that validation that you need and information that you need in order to move forward with the next phase of the project. Uh, the um, uh, prototype deliverables, proof of concept, is not always necessary. It really has a lot to do with if you have a lot of unknowns, right? If it's a new technology, maybe, that is uh, being implemented. Uh, but tools, at, if you're including design, like Figma, can provide plans with an inter interactive prototype, if maybe you're just looking for, for uh, wireframes in that way. 
It really gives them something tangible to take a look at, though. I mean, that's, that's really the point here, is that in the initial phases of the project, having something that you're actually delivering the value to the client immediately is really important to keep them engaged, to build trust, especially with new clients, that sort of thing. The phase names here are not meant to be prescriptive. <clears throat> I have you know, a couple other phases that I'll, uh, 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 deliverables that I'll point out here as well to do with implementation, testing, and launch. Um, again, these are not meant to be particularly prescriptive. It'll matter you know, what your team is and how large your project is or complex it is. But the point here is that having you know, these things outlined in a more manageable way uh, you can communicate uh, with the team and uh, using those project management strategies like this will help improve the partnership that you have with your client and with the, your internal teams as well. A win-win scenario. And just to kind of extend this a little bit farther, I think what we're talking about here specifically with the Agile uh, process is that uh, you're going to see that that particular deliverable, you're going to have specific uh, things that you're going to be doing within that deliverable, within that phase. So you're going to uh, sprint through your deliverable and uh, get to that end uh, goal and move on to the next deliverable here as well. And again, for complex and lengthy contracts, each phase is likely to be delivered over several 10-week planning intervals or something to that effect. Uh, but for projects, I think spe specifically that have some flexibility in contract and budgeting, especially when there are many risks or uncertainties, you can consider selling, potentially, um, or at least breaking up in budget, potentially, uh, certain sections of the project so that you can cost control a little bit better. And again, you might have some you know, increased earnings out of this as well. Without this, you know, I think that we all kind of run the risk of uh, throwing over the wall situation where you come with a design, <clears throat> you're working with just that design team during the beginning of the, of, of the project, and then you get to the end of the design portion of the project and you just kind of throw the designs over the developer. In this uh, you know, methodology that I'm talking about here, even early in the process, you're getting the developers involved very early with the proof of concept, immediately. So it designs to proof of concept and you're moving forward you know, with the entire team. So providing value there as well. All right, well, I, I wish I had the ability to toss around the microphone here, but um, you know, uh, maybe just a show of hands. How many of you worked, have worked with a multi-phase project before? One, two, yeah, about half, half multi-phase, sort of, maybe sort of. Okay, so yeah, I would say that that is my experience as well, is that there's this desire to have multi-phase because you really do get those checkpoints. You know, you're kind of um, um, getting those milestones set and those um, you know, deliverables discussed with the client uh, throughout the process. Uh, but that might not really happen effectively all of the time. So if you can, you know, really look forward to try to either create contracts that are separately uh, priced out um, with those phases, or at the very least, if you can't do that, uh, separate it out uh, into budget controlled, you know, sort of initiatives, separate initiatives, think of it that way, or planning intervals. So, <clears throat> You know, really that's the end of my talk. I do want to have a, a talk about a, a couple things to do with sponsorship. Here today, I, um, this session is brought to you by Optasi, a leading Canadian Drupal development agency based out of Oakville, Greater Toronto Area. Optasi embraces a phased agile approach for each major strategic initiative that includes discovery, design, build, deployment, leveraging support as a continued alignment and business uh, rebusiness mechanism. So, you know, I think a lot of agencies are doing this, like Optasi. Uh, some of their clients, um, including government clients and Canada as well, 
you can see here on the list. Uh, their experience uh, and expertise in the industry with over 19 years of experience and over 30 certified developers, Octasia empowers organizations to achieve success. And uh, just again, thank you to all our event sponsors. Without their immense and continued support, we would not be able to provide this valuable collaboration and networking space for our new and existing attendees. I will say that this is what I do off the side as well. Uh, you know, in addition to the Drupal for Gov internship program, I have a digital career sandbox. Uh, if anybody's looking for something new, if they're looking for support with uh, job opportunities, networking support tips, I do a Monday mess on Mondays. So talking about what you did last week, what you're gonna do this week, you know, just help support each other. I also have a profile and personal branding masterclass next week. Uh, and so follow me uh, on LinkedIn. There's a link here as well if you'd like to take that down. One other item, I am the leader of MidCamp. So next year in May in Chicago, we invite you to uh, come to MidCamp in the spirit of mentorship, contribution, and collaboration. We're rebuilding our sponsorship packages and growing our training program to attract and serve newer Drupalers. I think I've heard of that quite a lot here at this event, honestly, is the desire to have more intro-type intro courses for people, right? Whether it be development or site building or project management or whatever it is, I think getting back to our roots in that way is, is something of a focus for MedCamp. So whether you're, at, and also if you're a designer, marketer, or site builder, please take a look at the MedCamp Slack and join us. We need people. Yes, please connect with me. Find me on aboutme.com/technora, or you can take this down here, and it'll take you directly there. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. I, I hope you have a good rest of your Drupal GovCon. <laughs>